Okay, so today we're talking about mastering AI and chat GPT for marketers. So we'll be talking about the AI mindset, making data-driven decisions, scaling your content apps, or your content operations, excuse me, and um, strategic AI guidance. Our speakers today are Seth Vibra, who's a, a founder and CEO of 08, founded it in 2010. He is by trade a software and marketing engineer. He's built websites for famous artists like Justin Bieber and Mariah Carey, which is a fun, which are fun facts. Uh, Let a team is the chief technical officer at a social network startup company. Also co-presented at Stanford and the International Society for Neuronal Regulation Conference on EG study on consciousness. I worked in world-class e-commerce software as a software engineer and provided uh, Drupal expertise for Estee Lauder and many international brands. And uh, heads up 08 as the founder and CEO. We also have, and this is the challenge of live events, Ivan Handyand is the executive of new product transformation for GE Healthcare. He got called in by his CEO at the last minute. He's going to be late. But he's got a lot of great input being at GE at a large corporation and new product transformation. He brings a lot to the table, really interesting guy, lots to offer. So uh, he'll be joining us a little bit later. He's a global visionary and strategic leader in the healthcare technology sector, executive general manager at GE Healthcare, has led product and technology transformation strategies, translating business goals and customer needs into highly complex and impactful solutions that leverage cloud data, cybersecurity, AI, and ML technologies. Ivan also serves as a mentor and senior advisor in innovative startup incubators and accelerators, such as G-Beta Med MedTech and MN Cup, where he advises, invests, and mentors over 50 plus startups. He's obviously bringing lots to the table and we look forward to chatting with him. So at this point, I'm going to uh, stop sharing and hand it over to Seth, who focuses on AI on a daily basis and has some information for us. Yeah, so thanks, Karen and Jill and everyone for joining. This is the hype cycle that we've been uh, framing these AI discussions with. And we saw several months ago, a year ago, that we're, the inflation or the expectations were peaking or in, inflated, right? And now we're starting to see some of this disillusionment we're, we're seeing and this is a, a, a cycle that most technologies go through that Gartner invented. We're seeing things like this. Google plans to eradicate AI-generated content. Seriously. Clickbaity titles. But of course, if you read the article, they qualify that. And they're talking about a certain type of AI-generated content. Mass-produced content from large data without any human intervention. And then entire brands are doing things like this. They're adding AI restrictions to agency contracts. And of course, guardrails are good, but let's not. I think there's a lot of disillusionment and, and fear about AI right now. And some of it's valid, but some of it is just a, a matter of understanding. So part of that is what we're going to address today. These are the big players. Open AI is the big one. There's certain solutions emerging for corporate and enterprise and, and various tools out there. Jasper might be one that you've seen for AI generated content. But my message, fairly strong opinion for this event today is that solely relying or over relying on these tools rather than actually learning to interact with ChatGPT or whatever platform is actually a hindrance to your career development. So part of what we're going to talk about today is just basic concepts of developing a chat GPT mindset. And then I'm sure there will be related questions, or even if they're somewhat tangential, there's always something to talk about with AI. So this is my take on developing a chat GPT mindset. And there are five core steps that I see. Number one, save your prompts somewhere as templates. You've probably interacted with ChatGPT, or maybe you're like my mom and are afraid to do. Don't be afraid. Just go in, start typing, see what it does. It's not going to do anything bad. Save your prompts. As you start interacting with it, you'll, you'll notice pa patterns. Save these things that you type, these patterns as templates. Number two is to test your prompts, modify them, and then test again. It's an iterative process. You're going to get better and you're going to save that progress as 
a template essentially. And then number three is tell ChatGPT, if you're gonna generate content, tell ChatGPT to write content briefs first before actually delving into, hey, write me a blog post on this. Give Let ChatGPT give you some context first. And number four, it's better to freshen up your chats. Uh, and I'll get into that as to why. And number five is just copy paste, make it eat your garbage. I, I talk about it as garbage in, beautiful things out. It's amazing. Don't be afraid to write something and then put a colon and copy paste an entire Word doc or whatever it is. It can really, it's amazing what it can consume. Just to reinforce the message, I'm going to go into each one of these a little bit more deeply. So number one, save your prompts. For the general public or enterprise, and by that I, I probably should have said general people in an enterprise or work organizational setting, I really, really like Team GPT because with it, you can, I've got a little screenshot here, you can create a prompt and then in that prompt, you put little template variables, which I can show you really quickly right here. This is prompts that are defaults that come with Team GPT. I don't think they're I don't think anyone should use them out of the box, maybe a few of them, but something that you could totally modify or use as inspiration. So you can see here that the prompt has a name, a description, and then here's the prompt. And then oh, that's not a great one because it doesn't have any variables, but you could conceivably put a variable here like insert variable, right? And then boom, once you do that and you use that prompt, then you get these input fields where that variable is. You don't have to do it this way. You can save your prompts in the notes app on your desktop or laptop or iPhone or what, you know, whatever. Keep it simple. Or you could use Google Docs, a spreadsheet, Dropbox, whatever you want. But a prompt is just a chunk of text with some variables in it. And you, if you just wanna use plain text, that's fine too, keep it easy. Right, just put some brackets in there and maybe put first name in all caps and then end brackets just for yourself. And then you can manually fill that in every time you interface with ChatGPT. You don't need something fancy like Team GPT. But as you get more advanced, it might be something to consider, especially if you're working in collaborative team environments. Um, and Text Expander is another way to store snippets. I love this. Anyone who has ever been a developer loves stuff like this, but I can just show you really quickly. This gives you a quick little abbreviation to call up this snippet of text. So a prompt is just text, right? For example, if you, you could just put in a variable here, and then it will fill in the variable for you, just, just like Team GPT. And when you want, to, when you're in the Chat GPT interface or your email, wherever it is, this is not just for Chat GPT, but it essentially all you have to do is uh, type this abbreviation and it'll expand the text. That might be TMI, but if you're someone who writes the same thing a lot during the day, it's actually a really great tool and, and there is sharing for teams and things like that. You could store an email template or whatever it is that you type all the time within Text Expander. But again, keep it simple. Use a notes app if that's more comfortable for you. As you get more advanced or if you are an engineer or a very technical marketer or an aspiring prompt engineer, a really cool tool out there that I'm experimenting with is prompt layer. Some of the issues with just throwing your prompts in a text file or your notes app is that you probably won't get great version control. On Google Docs, there is some level of version history. But again, point number two is to test your prompts over and over again. So you're building these prompts and they have to get better over time, but what if the change you made breaks something or ChatGPT starts 
producing erratic behavior. You want to be able to rewind to the last version of your prompt. So that's where prompt layer is really cool for advanced folks. It also has a playground so that you can test prompts directly in this interface rather than switching from your notepad to chat GPT and modifying your notepad and then chat GPT, things like that. So take that for what it's worth. Lots of other technical features for folks that are really into that. And so that's number one. Number two, test your prompts, modify, test again. This is how you get better. Um, at times, ChatGPT might seem to act like an ine ine inebriated intern, right? Like it'll, it'll be like, hey, I told you to do this. Um, and especially as your prompts get more complex, it, it, you know, it's just like a program. You can have errors or things that you didn't realize that ChatGPT was interpreting a certain way. Figuring out how to write better prompts is an exercise in and of itself. So in order to help ChatGPT do what you want it to, give it context. I always give it context, like start with your brand guidelines or start with things about how you want it to write. So voice style guidelines for writing. If we're talking, talking about generative AI here, information about your target audience, things like that. And if you don't have that with ChatGPT 4.0, or Team GPT, any of these, I think yeah, Gemini should be able to do it too from Google. Just give it your website and tell it to come up with something, right? Something is better than nothing. If you don't have voice and style brand guidelines for how to write content, just ask ChatGPT to make something up and then maybe you want to modify it. But something is better than nothing as far as context. And then be explicit, write very clearly, like you are writing for an inebriated intern right out of college or something like that. Very clearly use numbered lists. Be like, these are the instructions. This is what I want you to do. Colon, one dot, first instruction, two dot, second instruction. Think about writing it as like a, a program in English. Be as structured and as explicit as you can be with your prompts. So that's to help guide ChatGPT to help yourself. If your prompts get more complex and they can get really long as you do more and more advanced things and tweak the output, use line breaks in your prompts, especially as they get bigger. That's okay. You know, make it visually accessible for yourself to go in and find the thing that went wrong and then edit it. And then the formatting, of course, helps chat GPT, but it also helps yourself. And numbered lists, anything visually to help you go back and look at your prompt. Oh, I haven't looked at this prompt in two months. I want to tweak this thing. Okay, make that easy for yourself. Keep it clean and structured. Number three, tell chat GPT to write content briefs first. Now, don't just... And of course you can, if, if it's a one-off quick thing you want to do, but in general, if you want to write a blog post about digital marketing strategy, this is a terrible prompt, by the way, in this, this screenshot here, but it's just for an example, you want to give it a lot of context and keywords you want to use, you know, whatever it is, but the goal is for it to give you what it thinks it should write. And that way you have the ability to modify that, right? So don't just say, write a blog post on this, have it output the outline, just like you would a human. My my theme, my, my general advice is to treat ChatGPT like an intern, right? Just super explicit. Give me the content brief before you start writing. Okay, that's wrong. Let's tweak this. I would actually like you to do this. Interact with it. Tell it to revise. And then once the content brief is good, then you can write your blog post. So, uh, we yep. have a question. From, we have a bunch of questions, but one that's specific to this from Michael Young about adding tone of voice to AI prompts. Can you talk yes. to that? Yes. Yeah. Oh, wait. We have certain brand guidelines. Now that I'm on the spot, I can't recall <laughs> them because they're in the prompts. See, this is one of the dangers of, of chat GPT is that sometimes you forget to think and remember your own right. uh, thing. Like uh, the prompts have already been fed the brand guidelines and the, the tone of voice, but you could say be more authoritative, but you confident and authoritative, but friendly. 
Yeah. So I here's can't. here's this and this goes right in the prompt, right? Our brand tone is smart, down to earth, and helpful. Blah blah. blah. Experience, action, professional, clear, authentic, friendly, responsible, data driven, customized, and then avoiding buzzwords, things like that. Oxford comma, avoid long and winding intro. So use active voice. All these kind of things. So that's how you would address that. Scott is and saying it, he sometimes uses ChatGPT to give the output in three different tones, and we'll explain uh, what the tone is before each response. That's interesting. I've not tried that. Yeah, absolutely. But if you're experimenting or in general interacting with ChatGPT as an idea generator, but also make it be the devil or make it be its own devil's advocate, right? Have it generate. Uh, an idea and then say, what's the, what are the pros? What are the cons? What's the antithesis to that idea? I, there's, yeah, I, I, I love that. Definitely be variable. So that's, yeah, that's number three. Any other questions that I missed that we want to address? We have a, a bunch of questions throughout, but maybe if you want to go through your slides, we can go through the, the questions and people can also just un, unmute and, and talk to you. Yeah, let's, uh, it's just five things. So let's try to get through these and then we'll have plenty of time once people have the context. Let's see. So number three, write content briefs first. And then once you have that, then you can say, write the introduction, write the first section and so on. That's the danger of using some of these tools like Jasper, which just pump out blog posts. And of course you give it some context, but it's not as interactive or customized. So I think you can actually produce much better content by interacting with ChatGPT directly and coming up with your own prompts rather than filling in the fields that Jasper gives you, right? Number four, it's better to freshen up your chats. This was a real world example here. I was being my own doctor about some, some things on my, some bumps on my foot and I started with a premise like researching poison ivy. And then I took a picture of my foot and you're welcome that I did not include that here. But I fed that to ChatGPT and asked it what it thought it was in that same chat. And the first result in the chat about poison ivy was poison ivy, poison oak. So then I was like, hmm, context. And new chats, right? So it's better to freshen up your chance. I Then I started a brand new chat, no context about poison ivy, took a picture of my foot and boom, it got it right because I didn't pollute the current chat with biased context. So always it's better to freshen up your chats. There's a certain window after which chat GPT actually starts forgetting things. And I guess I, I mentioned that here. So, you know, Team GPT actually warns you once you have exhausted its context capacity or the context window and it tells you about rates, gives you a rating on the efficiency of your current chat. Context is good if you build that up in a chat, but it's better to put that context whenever possible in a prompt and then refine the prompt rather than just hounding one thread over and over for multiple weeks on end. Yeah, and ChatGPT can be forgetful at, after a certain point within a, a, a thread. Lastly, copy paste, make it eat your garbage. You know, just feed it a call transcript, right? Copy paste the whole thing. You could probably up upload it as a file too, but often it's easier for me to just select all, copy, paste, give it an initial thing, or an instruction, take the following call script and create a value proposition for the product discussed. Give me a few different ideas. Here is the transcript colon. Just give it directions, colon, paste. Paste the garbage and it'll create beautiful things. Feed it an email and tell it to brainstorm blog topics from it. Colon, paste the email. Even an HTML e email, it might have things you don't expect from the copy paste just due to the markup, it'll figure it, it'll understand that's extraneous information most of the time. Paste an email from a colleague and ask it to suggest next steps. You want to 
be sure to use a professional version of ChatGPT if any potentially con uh, confidential info is involved, or better yet, of course, omit any confidential information. You can see right here, this is from the pro version of uh, ChatGPT for Teams, which we subscribe to, but says right there, oh wait, workspace chats aren't used to train our models. It does not say that in the free version or and potentially the personal version. I'm not sure about that. Of course, whether you believe that is a risk assessment for the corporation. Okay. All right. Do we have Ivan yet? This was his slide. I do not see him yet. Okay. We'll just, uh, let's just take some questions while we're waiting. Yeah, we've got a bunch of questions in the chat. The first one is from Courtney Jones. How to best leverage the power of the platforms? It feels like these tools are really powerful, but how to best use them is tough to decide. Kind of a broad question. Yeah, uh, I and feel free to chat there. If you're talking about chat GPT, the interactive AI chats, or all of the tools out there, Right. There's so many tools that everything has an AI by it. As far as interacting with the chat tools themselves, like ChatGPT, Gemini, Microsoft Copilot, it's a practice makes perfect and follow this mindset, save your prompts, start thinking in terms of prompts. And you just got to learn by doing. Yeah. Uh. I could refine that question a little bit more as a stream of consciousness as you were giving your presentation. But one of the questions is how are you seeing people leverage these different AI platforms? Because a lot of the clickbait material is AI is going to take over marketing departments or AI is going to do X, Y, Z thing. But are you seeing it more as a way to for people to consolidate ideas to then create um, content or create an item, or are you seeing it actually becoming more of a lead product that people are using to to develop their entire strategy? Is more where that question was coming from. Yeah, my my opinion or perspective is that AI can allow you to do bad marketing ten times faster. It can also allow you to do good marketing. 10 times faster. It can be a second brain, a, a second opinion, but it's not replacing marketers per se. Use it as a tool to get more ideas, to take things off your plate, to come up with strategies, to produce content if you refine your prompts of course just saying write a blog on digital marketing strategy and that's it that's all you got okay that's not going to be great google's no, no one's gonna find that interesting in the sea of content out there but if used strategically it can really be your assistant your intern that gets less and less inebriated as you refine your prompts and, and get better at interacting with it. That's great. She, the second part of uh, Courtney's, thank you for that, especially the part about sometimes it gets confused. I was using it for a personal thing the other day, like for a five day trip and like flights and this and that. I'm like, okay, can we do it in four days and spit out another five day? I'm like, nope four days and it spit out another five day. I'm like, I better start a new prompt. So that I just ran into that just two days ago. And also Ivan is here. Hello. Welcome. Thank you for so, so much for coming. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Sid. Sorry, a few minutes late. We had a meeting with the CEO. So thanks for accommodating my request. Glad to be here. Absolutely. And your timing is perfect because the second part of Courtney's question is what to look out for to protect proprietary information. That was an issue at her last role. And we had a discussion about this in preparation for this meeting, Ivan. I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit and then we'll set way in. Absolutely, no, glad to. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a big concern from a business standpoint and how we use these big, they call large language models like ChatGPT. You could say there's Google, Gemini, AI, and there is an Anthropic, if you're really into it, Claude. So those are three major LLM models, like in obviously big tech companies are sponsoring. So each of those LLM models are open to public, right? So if you enter any information, 
that information is fed into the training model. For example, if you're entering your customer, maybe strategy discussion, you want to understand something about the strategy. So you ask the chat GPT. So that question about your specific company can be incorporated into the training set. So anybody who is looking for it can pull that information later on based on their prompts. So what LLM models have done, as I work for G Healthcare, is like we have a private endpoint network, which is basically means it's a wrapper they call like something around the LLM model. So obviously you would have your functionalities of a chat GPT, but then you can layer in your company's proprietary information. So that endpoint is only for your company's information. At the same time, all the queries or the prompts, this is the right way to say it, you ask the chat GPT will not be exposed to a public audience. It's only with the private and all the information you have, actually you can put your own company information in there, will be used for any prompts that you want to have. So that so so that's what the companies are doing. They're having their they call private endpoint. So you can create your own chat GPT for your own company. And that way you're protecting your uh, proprietary information, you know, of your company and is within intact. Like for, for example, my company you cannot use chat GPT at, at work because of the, you know, I would say filtering or of information that can pass through to go into the public domain. Karen Thank you for that. Seth, any commentary on just privacy and chat GPT? Yeah, that's every company or industry is going to have different levels of risk management that they need to perform, right? So if you're if you're producing recipes for a cooking network, who cares, right? <laughs> like create, help it create the recipes for the cooking network. But in medical, financial, of course, you need to be more regulated and protective and, and do proper risk management. So I, I would encourage people not to be afraid of AI, but also if you are in one of those industries, do the due diligence and set up a proper technical implementation and do risk management before feeding. And ideally, you're not feeding proprietary stuff, uh, especially if you're creating blog content or things like that. But um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's an important distinction, whether it's um, something that you're going to put on your website that will be out in the public anyway, or if it's proprietary information, and corporate secrets, the secret sauce, you want to keep that private. That, that's a really important distinction. <clears throat> okay, we have another question um, from Punita about any book for prompts, and Mike responded. Mike Powell responded, Punita, I've seen many prompt packages available for purchase, findable via Google, but prompting is an art that continues to change as may your needs. Any commentary about prompt books, packages? Yeah, I agree totally. There's tons of packages out there, but... Ultimately, they sit in isolate. My experience, they tend to sit in isolation, unless you're actually creating them and understanding and modifying them yourself to make them personalized to your needs and your specific situations. But they can serve as inspiration. But it's better just to learn. There might be a book out there on prompting. Honestly, I would ask ChatGPT yourself on how you can write better prompts. That's what I would do. Yeah, no, I, I want to echo. So the books are good. It gives you a general framework, but the success of having a good prompt engineering is when um, you know the domain. Like when I say the domain, like really what you're asking for, all the variables can you list it, right? So you can be having like 18 variables, making a professional or look good or whatever, that variable that defines what you're looking for. I think the more specific you are with that domain, the more targeted response you could get from the prompt engineering, right? So you, like to the point I said, uh, if you ask for a book, it will give you a general book, but what kind of book, what do you want to get out of that book? The more color you can add to it is going to be the key. So I think in my mind, what I have seen is folks actually have created like those specific variables or the facets of what you're asking for, and they keep it as a standard work. So you, we had a conversation that said, store it somewhere. So anybody wants to build on top of that, they can add more variables to it, right? So you maybe start off with these five variables or seven variables to what you're looking for. Maybe a house, a great house, color, or a bit. And then you keep on adding from your company's domain knowledge. And so that could be a knowledge repository by yourself, a proprietary standpoint for yourself. So that's something that 
that I would say that is important, more important than really understanding the, the book of a proper engineering. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Some great comments there in the chat. Definitely. If you're the type of person that wants to get into some of the, the techniques and read a bit beforehand, that, that Wikipedia article looks great, but also just don't be afraid. Don't see something that looks like code and be like, oh my God, I can't write a prompt. I have to buy the prompts from someone selling them to me on the internet, right? You can write prompts, you can do it. And yeah, trial and error with AI. It's, don't be afraid, just in it with it. That's great. Deanna, I think, asked a really good question that I hear a lot. I've heard that Google's updated algorithm punishes AI-generated content. We use AI to create foundations of content, and then we build upon them to humanize it. But will this negatively impact our SEO? Great question. Great question. Yeah, someone just, and uh, it's, yeah, this debate is not, I don't know. Someone with a software engineering background, it's if AI produces English and you feed it context and brand tone, like there's going to be a point at which it's sufficiently indistinguishable. This, this guy here, Ethan, uh, wrote something about this. I can put a link to this in the chat. They did some studies and, and they found that they also noted that Google has recently announced guidance around AI content, saying that AI content is okay so long as it's high, high quality. Uh, what else did they say here? I'll, I'll drop it in the chat and you can read it. Basically, my take you now as, as someone who used to be a software engineer and is now a marketer, go chat. Here's the LinkedIn. Check it out if you want. My take is that Create good quality content using AI, refine your prompts, feed it context, feed it your brand tone. You can even, you can even give it the URLs in your site map and tell it to do interlinking for SEO purposes. There, there are a lot of things you can tweak to get the content to a higher level. And then ideally there should always be some level of human interaction after AI has created the content, right? Adding imagery, finding notable sources or, or quotes or statistics, citing your sources, things like that. The lead or the introduction isn't compelling enough. Maybe that's something where a human writer takes that on. There, there are things you can do. And then infographics, uh, uh, things like this graph right here, that's all stuff that humans can and should do to enhance the quality of the content. But at, at a certain point, it's English. It's, it's, there's nothing that is in the text that is, I'm an AI, except for maybe certain ways of sounding or certain catchphrases. But that happens more often when you don't give it the brand guidelines, when you don't give it any context. Yeah, then it'll sound like AI. But if you get it, give it enough context, that, uh, the AI detectors will fail more and more and your content will be more and more original. Yes, that is great feedback. Absolutely perfect. Okay, Mike Powell weighed in and said, what keeps me up at night, even as a technically skilled person, keeping up with everything or building things keeps changing on a week to week basis instead of quarter or year. As you were talking about prompt engineering, I'm like, that's going to be a job if it's not already, like 20 years ago, there were no SEO specialists. And now it's, it's core to all businesses that operate on the website with a website, which is pretty much everyone. Maybe this question is for Ivan as you work with emerging technologies. How do you keep up on, with it? What advice do you have? Yeah. An engineer, uh, from a techie standpoint, I think it's very hard. You, you could obviously read stuff the way I have done is. And the best way is to do a project or experience that in my mind, right? I think if you're working in a company, have experimental projects that you can work on bringing in new technologies, because that's something, again, if it's a tech company, if you believe, I remember watching a lot of videos from blockchain, people have gone at the blockchain, have has gone a little bit with the crypto, now is AI, then is ML, then is Gen AI, right? So you will probably see a lot more come up. The key is really to, to, to really go after your interest. I have seen it sometimes it's just too overwhelming. You really have to think about, okay, what interests me? 
and read about it at the highest level and then dig deeper if it interests you in that particular area. Then AI came, it was more like, oh, it's a workflow or is an AI or is a analytics is an AI. Then the gen AI came and then it just changed the whole ball game about entire AI. So what's going to come next? I'm sure there's going to come something's going to come next after gen AI, right? So it's going to be hard, but what the way I have, at least personally, and, and I've seen a lot of folks do is just go in the path that interests you and do some project to showcase if you want to learn something about it. There is a lot of certification. We do a lot of AWS certifications, Google Cloud certification, Google AI. If you think about it, there is so much coming off. If you go to AWS, there's so much coming off from an AI standpoint. And it's just going to be hard to really wrap our brains around it. And my only request is read, the, read about it, but dive in if it interests you in a specific area. It's going to be hard to be expert in all of it. Yeah, that's true. I say this all the time. It, maybe there was a time when you could have had the sum of human knowledge regarding marketing, but that that time has passed. So I, I, you two speakers are both engineers by trade. I'm a writer by trade. I come from the creative side, but I surround myself by people who are smart and who and read a lot. And so you'll you'll never have the sum of human knowledge, but keep learning. I think that's great advice. Thank you for that. Okay, lots of great comments and feedback in the chat. If you're not looking at the chat, I would uh, encourage everyone to, to check it out. It's really active today. Thank you everyone for that. Courtney asked another question. Uh, have you seen a difference in outputs if using chat GPT for different industries like consumer goods versus med tech, for example? Have we any commentary on that different industries? Oh, I could go. So basically, I think the hallucination factor in chat GPT is still there. I just sent a, a slide that I generated to Karen. It had a lot of typos in it. So it will have a lot of typos in it. So that really will tell you that the chat GPT is not foolproof. And no matter which industry you pick, so that th this is something you could see. It was just complete from chat GPT. And you could see a lot of typos, a lot of graphs. What is it trying to say? So it gives you an idea that the algorithms behind it, it gives you a flavor of it but it does not give you 100% accuracy. So it doesn't matter if it's a med tech or a consumer, I would expect the similar amount of hallucination, what I call it hallucination, which is real. Uh, you can ask, for example, sometimes I ask about the consumer, so what are the trading? People do a lot of like, if people are doing trading, I do trading, right? I ask Charge GPT, hey, can you give me stocks that I can pick and I can trade? It gives stocks, but the stock prices are like not, it doesn't compare to today's values. It gives some junk value, right? I think it's so. It's really that that the chat GPT is, in my mind, you could say, hey, is it seventy percent accurate, sixty percent accurate? But it is very hard to discern from that accuracy level what it should say. Uh, in my mind, get content and inspiration from chat GPT, which we do it today, even from the marketing standpoint. We slashed, I would say, marketing budgets quite a bit from a content generation, but we still have human reviewers. To review to make sure that everything uh, lines up is it the message we want to say at the highest level so we do that so that's gonna kind of, I mean again in summary hallucination is there personally it was very hard for me to say hey you're 70 percent accurate or 60 percent accurate right it's hard but i cannot get the gist of the content and then i apply my own thinking and say hey what I, what do i want to say what do i want to present and then but steal the content from ai and tweak it for oneself karen yeah yeah, on the subject of hallucinations and prompt engineering, there are certain limitations to these models right now. They're always improving and these limitations might not exist a few months from now. But for now, you can say things like, don't make up a website URL, right? Don't make up a source. Don't make up a, st a statistic if, it, if you catch it doing that. And that's even more of a reason to engineer and build and refine your prompts is you can start to put some of those guardrails around the AI in, in your prompts themselves. That is great advice. Um, I'd like to dive into something that Ivan said and that um, we're seeing too. One of the things about working in agency is I get to talk to lots of companies, people who might be interested in working with us, people who are already working with us. And I'm finding it's a very weird time in marketing um, and that where budgets are being cut, um, which is 
if business is down, cutting the budget and marketing is, is a weird choice to me, but that happens and people are, they're cutting down staff. It's happening in a lot of different companies and a lot of different kinds of industries. Okay. We're in marketing. There's fewer resources, but a, a bigger goal. Now what? What can AI do to help? Ah, you want to take the first pass, Ivan, or do you want me to? Please go ahead and say it, please. Okay. Yeah. So I would say start interacting with it now as your personal assistant. Don't be afraid. Of course, consider the things we talked about based on your industry and risk and things like that. But start having it, or at least trying to have it help you write that email sequence. Again, proper context. Try to build a prompt before you just just say, write me these emails. No, give it context. Check out that Wikipedia article on, on, on prompt engineering to give you some ideas, some basic ideas. But start using it as your assistant now. Don't wait. Uh, I guess that's what I would say. Okay. Yeah, I was I would just build on what Seth had mentioned, right? So I think from a marketing standpoint, definitely there's a lot of pressure, right? I would look into the value add. Where is a unique value add piece mm. for somebody? So if it's a unique value add is a marketing collateral, uh, there's a lot of competition now. Even I could say that people could generate it, but you could be the person who tie the bow to say, hey, we could create AI to generate your marketing content, but you be that the last 30 percent last 25 percent so you can maybe 70 percent you can get from ai last 25 percent you will still have to do to make sure that you tie out so maybe you can charge your customers on that 25 percent and then come out ahead i think that's something you could do and then in in my mind a lot of marketing we talked about marketing collaterals marketing strategy you could actually use ai to ask for marketing strategies used by your competitors what are the marketing strategies used in your industry there's a lot of well, it just basically whatever you ask Google, but you could probably ask yourself. You could say, "Hey, based on the marketing strategy, successful marketing strategies in my industry, and these are my unique maybe value that I can provide. What could be my marketing strategy? Or you could offer this to your clients to say, "Hey, what could be their marketing strategy that you could put together?" Collateral is one strategy is different. So strategy you're applying your brains and to making sure that how it all fits it together. We can be able to say, hey, how much data do I have? What is my competition doing? What is my client trying to do? What is the path that like, I can represent or recommend the client? So you, that could be your, from an agency standpoint, as you're providing your agency, you know, a strategy. And then you can say, hey, I can also implement that strategy. Maybe you said, mentioned wherever you could use AI as an assistant, as an intern, maybe market research reports that you don't get from AI, right? So my, so many things, those are the things that I would say you could use AI for. I can remember, like we talked about AI is only 75%, maybe plus or minus, correct. You still have to vet it and put a bow on it to share your unique value to your clients. Great advice. So yeah, great takeaways. First of all, it's a good skill set to have in, in this day and age and going forward because it's not going anywhere to get your hands dirty. And number two, that it's a good assistant. It'll give you a good first draft. It still needs human intervention, but it'll take a lot. It could really get you scaled faster and get things going faster. That still requires human intervention. I do need to do a time check. We've got about two minutes left. We've had so many good questions. I didn't even get to all of them. I would say if anyone is interested in doing breakout rooms, we could do that for about the next 15 minutes. Before I do that, I want to genuinely and sincerely thank Ivan and Seth for sharing your knowledge and, and information. I'm trying to, to keep up and I do love AI and there's, it is moving really fast to um, one of the comments from before. Um, so thank you for, for sharing that. It's been really uh, interesting and helpful. Okay, if you're interested in staying, just stay and I will drop you into a, a breakout room where you get a chance to do some networking for the next 15 minutes. If you can't, I understand. Thank you so much for coming. This has been a really great discussion.